Tell me, since the uh, international law firms, I know the Dentons have a presence in the Middle East, um, Herbert Smith, I believe, have as, have as well. Are um, Western or European or American law firms entering in the Middle East? How are they perceived by Middle Eastern businesses and consumers? And is there a relationship of trust? Well, frankly, it depends. So we have to, uh, we have several categories that we have to take uh, into consideration. First of all, if we're talking about high level uh, knowledge when it comes to uh, complex and structured uh, projects, agreements, etc., definitely we all recur to the international uh, experience. So we have to differentiate here in between three categories. You have Practically, the mere population, if someone has a simple problem, you know, he might definitely go to a local, uh, to a local law firm. And then you have the middle size, the SMEs, uh, SMEs and the startups. It depends on what kind of new ideas they are bringing to the, to the market. And then you go to the more complex legal matters where definitely uh, the input of the international community through uh, through uh, international law firms or international legal experts joining local law firms are very essential so definitely uh, it depends now uh, you have you have you have a lot of international law firms operating in the middle east so you have mentioned uh, two or three of them, but definitely you have more than 35 to 40, up to my knowledge, uh, international law firms. And I'm only talking about the international law firms. Now, if you're talking about the legal information providers as well, you have Lexis, Lexis, you have, uh, you have Thomson Reuters and the like. So it's really an emerging market. Uh, it has its own challenges. I think we're going to have time to talk about that. But when we're talking about trust, Definitely, there is a huge trust in uh, the international legal community uh, uh, establish, uh, being established in, in the Middle East. I think that's going to be very reassuring to hear for any law firm which is planning to include the Middle East in its, um, in its international plan. Um, when, we, when we moved our law firm and our, our legal tech services into, into the Australian market, um, it's very interesting that you make that differentiation between the consumer and businesses because we found something very similar. I, I tend to think businesses are just used now. They're familiar with dealing with international contacts and partners and suppliers. I think particularly culturally, any business which is expanding, whether that be into the USA or the Middle East or Australia or, or for that matter, into Europe, this issue of the culture of the people who they will either be working alongside or potentially servicing is something which we really must prioritize. Is, is, is that your view? Well, definitely, yes. And what, what, what you've just mentioned is that a UK firm is being established in, in, in Australia. It's, a, it's the Commonwealth. It's the same culture. It's the same language, etc. Well, having a, a German or a French uh, law firm or even a UK law firm joining, uh, being established in the Middle East is uh, much more complex, I think. First of all, we have own ways to take into consideration the cross-cultural issues. And even in the Arabic world, when we're talking about the Middle East, we're talking about several cultures within the Arabic world. So when you're talking about Lebanon, Lebanon, you have a full freedom of speech. It's not regulated. We're really independent when it comes to such democracy. But when you go further into several other legislations, you don't find the same maybe freedom of speech. Even when we're talking about, uh, just for you to know, we have around 18 million words in the Arabic language. So we're... Uh, we're much, uh, I, I'm not sure how many words we have in, in, in English, maybe we have around uh, uh, six or seven million, so it's very rich. And you have to know that in the Arabic world, we don't speak the same language. 
So we speak Arabic, but it's very different. Like we here in Lebanon, we speak different, a different Arabic than uh, uh, people in the Gulf or in Morocco or in Algeria. So that is another problem. So you have, first of all, the cross-cultural things. So maybe uh, the culture we have in Lebanon might be different than the one that we have in uh, in Dubai or the one we have in, in other parts of, of the Arab world. So And then you have the religious part. So you have a lot of regulatory. Uh, if we're talking about total beverage, for example, so dealing with total beverage in uh, Lebanon is different uh, than, than Jordan, is different than Egypt, and is different than uh, Gulf and Saudi Arabia, definitely. Yes, and just touching back on the language issue, in terms of the the, the, the way language is used um, in society and culturally, I mean, clearly that that's something which any um, any any European or American practice entering the region would have to, I would imagine, bring people on board who could uh, help with that. In terms of the actual language of the law or, or language of business, just what language letters are written in, the, the, the language that's spoken in courts, is there any consistency in, in that or does that tend to differ per country as well? Okay, here we have to differentiate in between three parts. First of all, if, if we're talking about the courts, usually it's the Arabic uh, it's the Arabic languages. Definitely in all our laws uh, within the Middle East, you have uh, the right of having a translator. So you can never, uh, a judge can never hear anyone without having a translator if he's not uh, from, uh, if he doesn't speak uh, Arabic. This is what. Second, in some parts of the Middle East, and I'll give an example like the UAE where you have the uh, Dubai International fi Financial Center, the DIFC, where it's the English court through retired English uh, judges practically who uh, deal with the, with the cases. And then the language is practically the English language uh, in general. And then you have not to forget about the, uh, the other part when it comes to... Uh, uh, to, uh, to conflict resolutions is the arbitration, mediation, and all those. So practically, it depends which languages the parties decide. Now, going back to the businesses, I, we have also to differentiate in between the high-level uh, businesses like the multinationals, etc. At the end of the day, the language is the English language. So most of our emails when it comes to our multinational clients or, uh, uh, you know, uh, parties are in English. But when we're addressing the government, usually the official language is Arabic. So it's always translated into Arabic. So you have also here to take into consideration the amount of work that we do when it comes to regulations and regulatories. So practically whatever uh, uh, product you have to bring to the Middle East, we don't have the same uh, regulatory. So it's not, it's not like the EU, for example, where you have one single regulatory if you want to, uh, uh, the, uh, the, to import any product. Well, it depends on each and every country. Yes, and I mean, any law firm considering any form of international expansion really must make sure that they do their ju the due diligence properly in terms of all these really important areas. You mentioned earlier, Rani, some of the other challenges which any business and any law firm might face in, um, in doing business and expanding in the Middle East. Obviously, we've mentioned language and culture. Are there any other challenges which uh, businesses looking to expand in that part of the world might face? Well, definitely. Well, the limit is the sky. We have a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities because I always consider that any challenge is an opportunity at the end of the day. First of all, we have the legal and regulatory environment in uh, the Middle East. So people, they consider the Middle East as one uh, single uh, body. People have, uh, law firms have to know that it's not. So if I'm, uh, I'm being... Uh, 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 I want to establish, uh, if I want to establish a law firm or anything 
in the Middle East, approaching Dubai courts is different than approaching a KSA regulatory when it comes to that. So it's not the same uh, regulatory. Uh, part of this world you might not have, except by a royal decree, a license to uh, to become a law firm in uh, the Middle East. So you will always need a local partner. And this is a major issue. Uh, I give an example when it comes to uh, freedom of uh, speech or the different cultural thing that we have. So sometimes a local partner in an international firm might find it very difficult to uh, to to, uh, to apply all the LGBT uh, part, uh, you know, related to the international standards where we have local laws to adapt. So those are really uh, day-to-day headaches uh, that we have to take into consideration. So obtaining a license is not always uh, as easy as uh, we think. Definitely, if we're talking about the global 10 big law firms, it will be easier than a uh, middle-sized law firm who would like really to venture itself in uh, in the Arab world. I'll also talk about compliance with anti-money uh, laundering. So practically in the Middle East, uh, reaching the law when it comes to money laundering is easier than uh, in Europe. So we have definitely our regulations, etc. But you know, it's the culture. I always consider that the culture is very important and being you know, uh, and without giving a specific legislation or a, spe- a specific jurisdiction, practically when you see uh, 160 or 180 nationalities uh, coming to a country like Dubai, definitely cross- cross-cultural issues would be much bigger than a uh, a simple country where you have three, four, five, ten nationality and nationalities doing investment. So I'm giving you those. Uh, definitely, I won't talk again about the cultural and uh, language barrier. So, uh, and I, I've created a new word, frankly, that I have uh, trade, uh, I registered uh, I registered it as a trademark. It's localization, L-A-W-calization, Okay. So we always talk when it's, I'm an IP lawyer, so whenever I'm in a business meeting, everybody will tell me that, okay, I'm not sure if uh, if I'm going to the Dubai jurisdiction, I'm an arbitration fan, if anything happens, I'm going to the ICC. And I always tell them, guys, that the more you go international, at the end of the day, you have to go back local. Because if you need to take any measure on a building in Dubai, you have to go to the Dubai local authorities and abide by their law and by by the UAE uh, federal and then the Dubai local laws. So at the end of the day, I, I'm, I'm a fan of localization. And here, we're, we're having a lot of problems with the international uh, newcomers. So... Uh, being a patent lawyer maybe uh, in in the US, uh, I might have all the knowledge to become a patent lawyer in the UAE or in KSA or in uh, Qatar, you know, because it's the international standards and the international lo- know-how. But when it comes to more local legal culture, okay, like uh, execution of awards, then I can, being a UK, being the best UK lawyer in the UK does not mean that you might have a real successful, uh, uh, you know, practice in the UAE because you go more to the local part. And here I'll talk more about the access to information. So thanks to the global legal knowledge players like LexisNexis and Thomson Reuters, practically the, the foreign community, the non-Arabic uh, speaker community are having access to a lot of legal information, but practically it's translated. So going back to uh, to roots, if I have access to one million or two million documents, a UK lawyer will have access to two hundred or three hundred thousand uh, document in English. 
So practically, this is also a barrier—a uh, a barrier that they that, that, that they need to uh, to consider. Well, I mean, there's two things that have really resonated with me there, Ronnie. I mean, the first point is I absolutely agree with you that what no business can assume that just because they've made a success of their business model or their strategy in in a given country like the UK, they cannot assume that they will just be able to jump off a plane and implement that success in a new country without impediment. And I think there's two reasons for that. The first one is just all of the the local challenges from a regulatory perspective, from a legal perspective, culturally that they will face. But secondly, there's kind of a mindset problem there because if a if a foreign law firm simply assumes that they do it better than the local competitors, I think they will immediately be faced with problems. So what I always say is be humble. When you're entering into a new country, work on the basis that you don't know best. You need the market more than the market needs you. So exercise humility, listen, learn, and show respect to local cultures, local people, and local businesses. I thought I cannot agree more, Simon, frankly. So uh, definitely. And if we want to go into details, we have big names in the Middle East. When it comes to the largest law firm in the Middle East, it's not, it's not a, a, a foreign global law firm. It's Altamimi and Company. Uh, it's, it's, it's one of the largest, the biggest. They are well implemented. They are always working in a strategy where they have local partners, knowing the culture, etc. And this is a proof that uh, having a big name and a huge success outside the region might might might, might not lead to the same success in uh, in another region. 